a kind of theme from yesterday about the long skulled people and how they worked and lived and died with Gaia because they didn't just go to ancient sites and do a bit of work they lived and experienced it all but before I do that I would really just like to thank Rory for opening up and uh, for the beautiful Juliet with her work I bought some of her hot chocolate and mushroom there we go. It's absolutely delicious. And wasn't Giles magical yesterday? Yeah. Honestly, if anything, I've lifted this festival to make. I saw all of you smiling. So thank you as well uh, to Giles and to the others I didn't have time uh, to see. So we're going to be looking at today uh, how the ancients created a design canon for their ancient sites because it's not just about lays it's not just about the mary and michael uh, lines that's well known that's when everything comes together that i'm going to be describing to you in a moment that's a geodetic power center it's not just the crossing point of lays it's not just the crossing point of earth currents and when hamish wrote that book he even said I'm only seeing part of the picture with Mary and Michael. He liked those to vein, uh, arteries rather, and the veins came in. So you've got other female currents, other male currents that are narrower. And you don't have to go to an ancient site to work with these. Go to your own back garden. You're going to have narrow male and female earth currents like that in lockdown, you know boring uh, but in lockdown I was on a train and nobody questioned me with overnight baggage it was extraordinary I wasn't in lockdown um, so uh, the, the, the thing is we're going to go back to that design canon remember yesterday I said the geo spiral pattern is the surface pattern of harmonic female water yeah and that set the esoteric center of an ancient site that's where I kind of left off yesterday. Now, when you get currents like Mary and, and Michael, like Hamish noticed, it's the underground female water that makes it veer off. And I said that yesterday. So the power in the land is Gaia's fluidic nature. And when you start to look at the names of the goddess, you've got Danu, Anna, uh, Don, and all of these come from meaning primeval goddess water. Okay, and I'm going to give you a demonstration of water divining with a hazel twig and we're going to look at why the Druids chose uh, hazel. But now we need to think, how did the ancients design and why did they design stone circles? Uh, and yes, they incorporated lays, yes, they incorporated earth currents, but the design canon of an ancient site is extraordinary. Yesterday I mentioned the neutral stone, cleansing yourself before you even go to the esoteric centre of a site is so, so important. So we've got that yin water, it's making the geospiral energy pattern that marks the esoteric centre of a site. Sustained water under pressure, the go goddess's fluidic blood, if you will, when there is under sustained pressure, it creates a circle around the geo spiral yeah so imagine now it's a three-fold energy pattern you've got the geo spiral esoteric center this is why at places like avebury for example the uh, the obelisk stone which is the central feature of the southern inner circle you've got the cove stones the central feature of the northern inner circle they're not the central feature they're off center because they're marking the fluidic nature of gaia so we've got a huge circle on the outside. Well, it's not rocket science to what the ancients did then. They placed the standing stones on the circular energy, yeah? Because the geospiral, when we've measured it, will get your brain into alpha mode, but the huge circle that the standing stones are sighted upon, that's energy extraordinaire. So if you want to be a part of that at a stone circle, you don't need dowsing, you don't need knowledge. Just stand in between two of the stones and put your hands out. And at certain times of the day, there's a geological wonder occurs. It's called the sheer force. And experiencing the sheer force, an ancient site, is a wonder. So all ancient sites are never more than two miles from a fault line. Fact. 
Okay, that's a geological fact. Now, when the sun and the moon comes over the horizon line, meaning that it's rising or setting, if you imagine that through the earth, you get a wave-like motion, like at the sea, shh, like that, and it's, it bathes the megaliths in a piezoelectrical force energy that you can feel. And if you go barefoot at certain times of the rising and settings, you feel the sheer force. And if you put your hand on the megalith, all of that energy is coming through you, that megalithic uh, energy. It's something really wonderful to experience. If we listen to Plato and we say, how was Atlantis designed? Concentric circles, isn't it? they were incorporating the female element of Gaia. And I, uh, for one of my books, I realized that the diameter of the metropolis, according to Plato, if you multiply that by 100, you get the diameter of the Earth. Okay? Same as Stonehenge. The diameter of the blue stone circle uh, is 79.2, and it was John Michel in The New View of Atlantis that calculate change miles to feet, multiply by 100 the diameter of the Earth. Gaia's presence is everywhere in her diameter, uh, in her body. So that's a design canon that is repeated. And you get aquifers, like I said yesterday, at the Hypogeum in Malta, where I take people, uh, ancient Egypt, uh, where I take people as well. These are facts. And it's only recently they got the aquifer uh, at Avebury. So that's a design canon. But then, when Gaia is in her strength and her fluidic power, she produces another energy pattern. So we've got the geospiral, we've got the circle. Then imagine, maybe a mile or two miles away, maybe three miles, you have a horseshoe shape going around that, that kind of configuration. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, what the ancients did then, that set, that separating the sacred from the profane, yeah? And what Guy Underwood, whose work I inherited that I mentioned yesterday, he noticed that it has protective energy because he realized that hens in the wild, yes, that one time they were in the wild, I believe, and, and geese, they used to nest on this energy pattern and never be molested by foxes. It's naturally protective, okay? So, what did the ancients do with this? They add at Stonehenge, it's like in mother's arms, embracing in that horseshoe shape. At Avebury, she's embraced in this uh, horseshoe shape, which is called a secondary halo, if you want to get all techno with boring dousing words. <laughs> um, but that's what, what it's called. But the ancients always incorporated it. And you know the walled cities of the ancient world? Yeah, they were walled cities. They were on that protective energy pattern to symbolically protect them, okay? So that's one form of uh, complete integration. Then you've got your earth currents, then you've got your ley lines, but you need mother's water there to, to begin with. And then the Christians and the Templars also uh, incorporated it, but on a different uh, level, uh, especially uh, like the Templars. So to me, an ancient genetic power center has everything in its gene pool. Okay, and then the megaliths come alive, like uh, I described yesterday, and with the sheer force, because they're all near a fault line. And I also I mentioned yesterday form energy and how we can manifest with form energy at stone circles. So that's a wonder. You know, I always think Gaia is ever present in, in her, uh, her fluidic uh, uh, body, uh, as, as it were. So when I was in Egypt, obviously I met Hamish in 88. He thought, I, like I said, he forwarded one of uh, my books, did a lot of dowsing uh, uh, with him. And then through his journey, especially in the Sun and Serpent, we realized there was another form of Earth energy. And, and Hamish, I mean, he already had plans to go to New Zealand, so he didn't have the time to focus on this. And uh, sadly, Brian has passed. It's Brian uh, who in initially discovered this, who used to own the hen shop at Avebury. We were up with Hamish looking for what's called uh, the Beckhampton Serpent. Yeah, so if you imagine Avebury's got four entrances, massive stone circle, and two are served with avenues. Okay, remember I said the avenues yesterday, Avebury, no proof whatsoever anyone walked in them is an archaeological fact. 
Archaeologists now suspect there's four megalithic uh, avenues and one was lost. William Stukeley, uh, an antiquarian in 1724, who visited Avebury, claimed he'd seen it. I found the Beckhampton uh, serpent. So he was really excited. So this is where I'm going to differ from my dad and from Hamish. Don't burn me. <laughs> no lightning, please. <laughs> Give me too much of a frizz. Uh, so, uh, Hamish and Dad said the Beckhampton uh, Serpent ended at Knoll Down. Yeah, that's what, what, what they said. But they, uh, I'm with William Stukeley and uh, another woman archaeologist called Maud Cunnington here. What they didn't realise at the time was there's another Henge monument ploughed out where that was going towards. It was, so it was going away from Avebury, it looks that way. So I think that's the Beckhampton Avenue, yeah? So, uh, so I disagree with uh, some of the guys. Plus, Maud Cunnington, could you imagine her? She's in the 1920s. There hasn't been a female archeologist apart from some in ancient Egypt, you know, like Agatha Christie uh, went there. So there's Maud with her long skirt on and her prim and proper hat and her pearls digging away like this, yeah? It's fantastic. She found the sanctuary. At Avebury, you can't see it. It was under the grass. But Maud did what William Stukeley said. Stand at the, uh, the Beckhampton Serpent and you will see Silbury, that's the head of the dragon, meaning a lost concentric circle. So Maud, with all her gaiety, stood on there and goes, she was so intuitive, it's there, I'm going to start digging. And she started digging and she found it, yeah? So, but something magical in Earth Energies happens at Beckhampton Avenue, okay? What Brian and Hamish realised was happening was you have a male vortex quite close to a female vortex. Not the size of Sedona. I've been to Sedona. It's absolutely fantastic. That's whoa, a vortex. This is like that vortex. So imagine you've got these two vortexes like this, a male and a female. Maybe not so perfect, maybe sort of like that. They drew it perfect in their book, The Sun and the Serpent, but it isn't. It's more like that, but it's aesthetically pleasing, like that. So what happens when you get these vortexes? They give birth to earth energy, yeah? So they're going like this, male and female, and then a current joins. But it's not like Mary and Michael, their separation, their duality, their male and female. This is when male and female combined. It's a hermaphrodite line. And the hermaphrodite line starts to go down the avenue. And so we did a lot of work after that. We took measurements of it because I thought, wow, you know, what if we could measure the Hertzian frequency coming out of it? And it was extraordinary. It was in a cycle of 10, 20, 40, 60 seconds, then back again, constantly in this rhythmic song uh, in the earth. And our ancients realized they needed to work with the male and the female at an ancient site. Of course, don't we all need work like that? But after the work, you're the hermaphrodite. Do you see what I mean? So it's not just about the male and the female. And at some sites, I love, and we call them a genesis line because it has a beginning. It's born of vortex energy. And Hamish, at first we thought there was just two going like this, which is written about in the sun and the serpent. But much later we realized, oh my gosh, that was only half the picture because there's about four or five vortexes all doing this, feeding in the male and the female energy uh, like that. So we can work on our male and female. We can work on where they, they cross, but we can also work on the hermaphrodite energy. Now, the other thing about hermaphrodite energy is uh, which Mary and Michael don't do so much, or Ellen and Bellinus, or Catherine and Peter. Uh, they're all Christianized, bring back their pagan names. <laughs> there, was a, there was a speaker that said, bring back their pagan names. It used to speak at the circles of knowledge, and it would be Bell uh, and Breed, you know. Uh, but anyway, that aside. Uh, so we can work with the, the hermaphrodite uh, energy. Now, when it's in its power, and imagine it's going really going through the earth, perfectly one, yeah? And it's going flowing through the earth. Every now and again, it goes, drum, create a spike that comes out of the ground, yeah? And um, we measured that as well. So imagine you've got a spike coming out of the ground. 
Now imagine you are a wonderful ancient site, a Neolithic, remember the long skulls that I discovered? You had a long skulled Neolithic site and it's a, it's a long barrow. And then it sometimes has seven, six, eight, but off, quite often in sevens, spikes of energy. Well, we can start working with that energy on our chakra system. Yeah, to become whole, to become male and female. And those hermaphrodite lines do that perfectly. Yeah, and you really do feel an amazing uh, balance there uh, as well. So what I think is my feminine mission to do with earth energies is to say there's so many different types of earth energies that we can uh, work with rather than to get fixed and grounded in, in lays and currents. Do you, do you see what I mean? So we could work with hermaphrodite uh, energy. Then uh, again, back in the day of uh, you know the 80s, when Hamish was dousing the Mary current flowing down the axis line of Glastonbury Tor, for example, it went, hey up. It's, well, it probably didn't go, hey up, actually. <laughs> hey, hey, hey up, hey up, Maria, bye, heck, have I suddenly gone Yorkshire? I'm Wessex. Got a Wessex accent. Um, and suddenly it went into these diamond shapes. Uh, and Hamish said, I'm at a loss. And, uh, and dad came along and said, ah, that's because in the Chinese uh, feng shui way, that's where people stood and created uh, an energetic force that, that did that. So we can really, these are sentient uh, energies that they really, really are. And like I said yesterday, if we kind of ask to work with it, the water memorizes uh, our energetic signature so that we, wherever we are in the world, we can link back to the memory field of where we contacted uh, Gaia uh, and, and her fluidic self. So we've got Genesis uh, lines, for example. We've got the male and the female. We've got circular energy we've got the geo spiral pattern and we've got the protective energy that that water gives that's a design canon do you see what i mean when everything comes together like that you have a power center extraordinaire so on the giza plateau uh, for example you we all can visualize it one two three pyramids uh, like that, some pyramids uh, in front, and the whole of that Giza plateau uh, with the Sphinx and the Sphinx Temple, for example, is all incorporated into that horseshoe shape, as was the metropolis and Atlantis. You just look at the shape and you can cut, start to see that. So uh, that's what I mean. You can choose what do I need to work with and ask to work with those different uh, sorts of uh, energies uh, there. And what I think, you see, is that the, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, the long skulled people, yeah, I think that they were so sensitized to the earth because they were the first original geomancers. Why do I say that? Why do I say a completely different race to us? It should be our ancient site, mine. Uh, but it isn't, because if you go back to the Mesolithic, preceding the Neolithic, then you go to the Neolithic, that's when the lines were laid out. And then along came the Beaker culture, oh, I'll put a stone circle there. Oh, along came the Druid uh, Iron Age priests, oh, we'll put a hill fort on there. Oh, along came the Christians, we'll plonk a church on there. Previous pagan sites, but put it, put it there. So do you see what I mean? You can get a timeline on a lay, but if you go back to the Genesis, the genesis in this, these long-skulled people. And like my uh, discovery was, I think in the Stonehenge environs, it was the High Queen that, that I discovered. And I've recently discovered the people of Avebury as well. So we have these different elements going on. That's for the living, okay? Uh, that's how we can interact in the living sense. But to the ancient Chinese, it wasn't just where you were when you were living. More importantly, it was where you were when you were ten, well, six feet under. Yeah, it, to make your dynasty, to make your claim in the land. Uh, Giles is uh, nodding away, and that's a very important factor. So, what's the design canon of the ancient dynastic way? 
I don't know how familiar you are with Stonehenge, but I'm going to take you to the Mid Bronze Age. That's 1500 BC. They changed, tinkered with uh, Stonehenge, changed the uh, entrance uh, to Stonehenge, and they then laid barrows out on what's called the axis line of the midwinter sunset. So imagine now you've got people buried on the outskirts of Stonehenge. Imagine uh, two huge concentric circles of burial mounds a thousand years away from the people that built it as any archaeologist will uh, tell you. So you've got a different culture building circles, like I said yesterday, with the, with the round skulls, uh, creating circles. 800 white mounds surrounded Stonehenge. With the physical naked eye, you see 800 stars above. It was a massive planetarium that this culture created, but they were looking for certain energies to place their dead upon because they were the dynastic rulers, the people, they were buried with gold and amber and, and fine jewelry. And, and wearing, like I said, this is a pre-coinage money ring. They were dripped in gold and, and money rings and, and things like that. So they were a dynastic cult. So they were looking for an energy that wraps around the ground in concentric circles like this. So if you just imagine a barrow, Bronze Age round barrow like that, gleaming chalk white, and then it's encircled. And that if those circles are created, when you get uh, yin water there at, at that angle, and then water here, two, that's called an interface. When you get an interface of water or earth energy, it starts to generate concentric circles. And that's what the Chinese would look for to place their departed and deceased upon, yeah? So you have these, these amazing uh, energies like that. And uh, I'm really proud to say that for the largest cemetery in South Africa, well, one of the largest in South Africa, and I was working with a guy, fun, oddly enough, from the Mersey <laughs> in Liverpool, and we've created a modern day version of this in graveyards where you have guardians that are going to go into the ground uh, straight up uh, because the, the, you know, the dead were placed in different positions in, in the Bronze Age. Uh, to, to, the, to the Neolithic. So, why did they do that? It's because it's energizing their, their bodies eternally. Do you see what I mean? So now, let's flip to the royalty. Can you remember what I said yesterday about the esoteric center of an ancient uh, manor house? Well, what they would do, for example, big family in Europe, the Habsburgs. Can't tell me they, they don't burn our effigies somewhere. <laughs> Uh, being a Bilderberg or whatever. Uh, so you have this, uh, this family, this dynastic rulership. They will look for the identical patterns. Now let's go to Westminster Abbey and you find the same thing going on. Our kings and queens are being buried in a pagan way. Yeah, in a non-Christian pagan way. Yeah, so they were taking the designs secretly, covertly and placing the royals above it. Yeah, you can't tell me Queenie's not going to go on to uh, God, God Lover, don't want her to pop a clogs. Uh, but you can't tell me she's not going to go on to that. And I will predict that wherever she is. Diana did it to Diana. Uh, they wanted to immortalise Diana. Yeah, and they do a strange thing in Wiltshire. You can't get away with much without Maria knowing in Wiltshire. Yeah? <laughs> so, so watch it when you, you come to, to, to Wiltshire. There's a house. A grand house sold for millions called Pound House. Yeah? yeah? Been there. Yeah, did you go with Catherine? Yes, Catherine. Yeah, yeah, yeah isn't Catherine uh, amazing? And Catherine, these guys are uh, nodding here, is all symbolism to do with our money and our, and our currency. Even our word currency comes from the in water, current, currency. Chinese will want water in the north, yeah, to, to, to generate, just put what you know, a picture of uh, water in the north of your house and that will uh, kickstart uh, uh, that. But in Pound, uh, in Pound House, uh, for Lady Diana Spencer, they did a very strange thing, which I'm sure you guys were shown, uh, is they have a light at one end of a very large room, yeah, and the light is called Sol. So you join your own dots there, sun. And then they get the shape of a royal or someone of your authority, like Lady Diana, and they draw around her. And they had Lady Diana facing this way. 
Lady Diana facing that way, and then Lady Diana this way, the triple goddess of power, yeah? So uh, that's one reason maybe she was coming into her power, coming into her triple aspect of her goddess as she was getting older. And I'm sure she would have kind of been a bit of a problem <laughs> for the royal family somewhere down the line, maybe even marrying a Muslim, you know, who, who knows? But the whole point is they encapsulate through that and pound houses on very, very strong earth energies. And it has all of the elements there uh, with, with, with the water and when they even draw on this that it has power. Another long lost right in earth energies, remember I said on the Genesis line you get these pulses like this and you can work on your chakra system. Places like Glastonbury Abbey but again in royal households. The first royal palace uh, incidentally was St. Saint James's Palace, not Buckingham Palace. Okay, so at St. James's uh, Palace, you have one of these pulsating energy lines because when they have their children, you don't just open up the third eye chakra, which is useless if the other chakras aren't open. Yeah, so they do just do this, don't they, in the baptism. I'm, I'm proud to say I'm a pagan and my parents never baptized me. <laughs> and nor was my daughter Raven. Uh, so, but a lot of people just have that. We know that, don't we? That's a, that's a Christian right. But that's ineffective for that child to become a spiritual being. So what the, the royal family do, for example, is they pulse and say to, are down uh, like a Genesis line so that all of the chakras are awakened in that child. Do you see what I mean? It's a symbolic and it's always a processional way whether that's in a church, whether that's in a house, because pews are much later addition. Yeah, it's a bit like, you know, a front row uh, cinema seat. Oh, yeah, you're at the front row, give us a tenner, you're at the back, two quid. Yeah, and that's why pews were introduced. Before that, you pr process on the energy lines. Do you see what I mean? And, uh, and then create a kind of way which you can open up your chakras effectively because they're all ancient sites. And this is the beauty and this is the grace. A gift from Gaia, and it's free. <laughs> is that uh, when we go to these ancient sites, as soon as you enter Avery, once you've cleansed your aura and, and got it in, into neutral, please do that on the, the neutral stone, then uh, you, you are in an altered state of consciousness. Yeah? As soon as you enter, especially in places like, uh, like Egypt and, and Malta, but, but Stonehenge and Avery equally, you're already in that altered state of consciousness. And that's when you can really start to work. Uh, with uh, with energies and, and sometimes you don't have to be sat in the on position <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do this spiritually because my own personal experience as uh, Kerry Cassidy and where's the delightful Pippa Pippa because uh, we know Kerry is uh, a Kundalini expert don't we she, she's uh, Kerry Cassidy of Project Camelot God lover taken down after 20 years by YouTube for mentioning yeah, they even changed it to Maxine and <laughs> the AI picked up on the word Maxine and, and the Basis Project uh, came down, 25 years uh, Basis Project uh, down. But when Kerry and I take people to, uh, to Egypt, we always say, you don't have to be sat down being spiritual. It will happen and it will awaken to you. So my own experience um, was with, uh, with Kerry and thank goodness I was uh, with Kerry because um, in, in Egypt, as you probably know, who's been to Egypt? Oh, amazing. It's amazing. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, God love the ancient Egyptians. Uh, I love it. I'll tell you what I discovered there in terms of earth energy uh, in a moment. But, uh, yeah, I know, I've got competition. They're better than me. <laughs> yay, yay! Hope you want a kebab. <laughs> huh? That is a sad thing about that. I don't eat meat. Um, so yeah, so uh, I was uh, in Komombo Temple, and that's the one by the Nile. Can you remember if you've been there? It's the one by the Nile with the crocodiles. Yeah, yeah. You remember Komombo? It's it's a wonderful temple dedicated to the god Horus uh, and Sobek. 
isn't it? It's, it's a double, that's rare, isn't it, in ancient Egypt to have this like duality uh, going on. And you bribe your way through Egypt, don't you? You bribe, oh, here you go, here you go, here you go. Oh, we can meditate here, here you go. And uh, one of our group uh, got a little group together, didn't bribe the guards and started meditating. Then you're in trouble, yeah? Because you have to pay to have that privilege. So and everyone looks at me, Kerry looks at me, so I have to go along. <laughs> Don't stop, please stop, please stop. And they did stop. And then I was kind of in a bit of annoyed space. But they know the protocol. Why, did, why didn't they do that? So I'm actually thinking like, like this and, and go to sleep. And the next minute in the night, I had a massive Kundalini awakening experience. And it was scary. Yeah. Anyone who says it isn't, oof. It was like I just woke up, bolt upright in bed like that on the Nile. I thought, well, what, what happened there? And then I couldn't move and I couldn't speak. And then this electricity came from the bottom of my feet, went all the way up my body and it hurt in my head. It was so like getting like this. And I was thinking, oh my God, oh my God. I, I thought I was gonna have a seizure or, or something. Uh, and then I was shown the light like that. And I thought that looks quite cool. Then I was shown the dark, that looks sexy. <laughs> I thought, whoa, that looks pretty good. Oh, like this. Uh, because it was an allure. Do you see what I mean? It was a huge allure. I could see that I could be so much in either one. And obviously, I, I went to Horus, you know, and, uh, and became, became the light. But I couldn't speak the next day. My voice gone. So I'm writing down notes. I must remember this when Kerry can't speak. <laughs> Kundalini experience. Can't move. It's only the last day of the tour and we're supposed to go to Isis and I teach Isis Egyptian pendulum dancing. I'm thinking, oh no, this is my height of the heart chakra because it's, it's amazing. Uh, energy devices, ancient Egypt left us in, in pendulum uh, healing. So they were very loving and kind, like all of you uh, would have been. And they were checking and Kerry said, you're going to have to start eating heavy foods, ground, ground yourself, you know, and, uh, and all of that. But I, but I walked away a different person. So that was like Egypt. So that was the first time. So it's like, Ugh! you know, coming off the plane. I didn't, I didn't know who I, who I was for about six months. Uh, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? Giles, Giles is not nodding away. It is a crazy experience. So the second time, feel prepared now. <laughs> yeah, have the Kundalini thing going on. Feel uh, balanced and prepared. And uh, then I started to do a lot of uh, dowsing and energy work. So I do energy work uh, as well. And then I was thinking, well, Hamish uh, found this. These guys have found a lay. I wonder if it's got the two serpents entwining it. Yeah, like uh, Paul and, and, and Hamish and people like Rory know very, very well. Yeah, and that's what I was uh, kind of thinking, thinking about. And I got the temple's permission each time. Bribe the gods <laughs> each time <laughs> like that. Uh, running low on the dollars because um, I don't like uh, anything else apart from uh, the dollar. And uh, so I'm starting to douse with a team with me as well, uh, experimental and seeing what we were getting. And I never influence, when I'm dousing to find things out, I don't tell anyone what I'm dousing because my father was a, he's more foxier than me, God love him. He used to say to people, on the last day of his dousing course, he wasn't gracious like Hamish, <laughs> bloody northerners, uh, <laughs> from Newcastle. Uh, and what he did on the last day was he'd say, there's a ley line over there, I see, he, see who can douse it, and people would go and douse it, and he'd go, okay, who didn't douse it, who didn't find it, we didn't find it, it's not there, ah. made it up. Because a power of suggestion is an amazing thing in dousing. Do you see what I mean? Because we anticipate things. So I went blind with, with everybody. Gave them a bit of a map of uh, the wonderful Abydos. I mean, isn't Abydos great? Yeah. Who's been to the Osiren behind it? Isn't the Osiren something? More money. <laughs> Dollar bills. But the Osiren, you've got to remember, you've got this beautiful Egyptian temple to Seti the first. Some say. We disagree with that. We say it was much, much, much older in ancient Egypt. Patricia Ariane, Brian Forster, who I also go to uh, ancient Egypt with. We say no, because when you go to Luxor and, uh, you know, Karnak Temple, the largest temples in the world, you see statues of Ramesses everywhere, isn't it? And it's like what we say, Ramesses was here, yeah. 1500 BC, but it was much older than that. And so we're at Abydos, I give them maps, 
and saying, and I've already kind of done the work and thinking, looking for this energy system, even if it exists or if it doesn't. And then we found a, a really strange thing. You've got the, the line that comes down like a Hamish uh, fame, and you have your two ones. And in, in Abydos, you have at the far end, they call them chapels. I'm sure the ancient Egyptians are in total annoyance of that. But they call them chapels. You have one to Isis, one to Horus, and, and you get the thing, and there's seven, one to Ra. And uh, they're, so they're like niches, if you will, within, within a building. And we found three earth currents of power going through ancient Egypt, not two. So we decided to call them Isis, uh, Horus and Osiris. And with Earth energy as well, we see everything as 2D, don't we, on maps. We see everything as, as 2D. But as I'm sure Rory and others would tell you, it comes out of the ground in the Earth colours. OK, now to the ancient Egyptians, uh, have you heard of the Karnak pendulum? No? Oh my God. It's a, a pendulum device from ancient Egypt, yeah? You're in the 1930s now, probably not dressed like Maud, probably dressed in those silly little hats that they wore in the 1930s. It's bedlam in the Valley of the Kings. It's bedlam. You've got the Italians digging. You've got the Brits with Carnarvon fame, yeah? And, and you've got, you know, multitude of people digging away. It's noisy, it's dusty. They're all trying to find the gold. Carnarvon gets, gets it. But so you imagine all of this going on and lots of people shouting in different languages and, and digging because it wasn't a UNESCO World Heritage Site. <laughs> so what the French team discovered was on the mummies, on the heart chakra, if you will, they just say on the chest, but I, on the heart chakra, this energy device that looks like this. And they were thinking, well, what the hell is that? And then they found all through Abydos another one with things going down like this. And the priests are blowing into them and digging them into the earth like this. And they thought, what are these devices? What if we, in the 1930s, replicate them and take them to our laboratory? What could they do? And what they did is astonishing. It's went down in dowsing history forever. So, Tommy and Debelazar, that's their names. And they were thinking, they discovered the esoteric colours of the sun. You know there's seven colours of the, the visible spectrum of the sun? Then you get infrared, which is the heat, yeah? They claim there were other esoteric colours, one of which is called the negative green, because it lies opposite positive green, spiritual gold, ultra white, and ultra black. And these make up the esoteric colours of the sun, God, Ra. Gaia has her own colours, incidentally. I'm just going to focus on the esoteric colours of the sun god Ra. And they knew that if, a, if you imagine that each colour of the sun has a horizontal flow and a vertical flow, yeah? That's how they see it. So this is going on all of the time. This is harmonic for you. So that colour of the sun is harmonic. When it comes up like this in its negative green, not so harmonic. And they were thinking, there are mummies. I wonder if it can help in the mummification process. So now Chalmery is alone in his laboratory and uh, he's filling an object up so much with the negative green that his uh, collaborator goes into the laboratory two weeks later, no smell of fermentation of the dead, but he's mummified, yeah? So that went down in Dowson history and then his papers got handed to Ibrahim Ibrahim Karim, who does biogeometry. And uh, I remember my, my dad telling me this, and I'm thinking, what? And so he goes, there's only one place for the negative green, Maria. We're going to go and experiment. Oh, I'm not going to go and experiment. Are you crazy? You know, I'm 24. I'm not going to experiment with a negative green. Uh, and so, but he did. He got a steak, because if you get a steak and you put it into negative green, in mum's Tupperware pot, she had no idea a Tupperware was going to be in part of a crazy experiment. Um, and he went back. We didn't open it up because it's full of the negative green now, but the huge steak was like that, mama find. Yeah. Now, if you're in the negative green space for a little while, that's fine. 30 seconds and it's healing, they found. But much more than that, it becomes detrimental and they think it was part of the mummifying process to the ancient Egyptians. So the Karnak pendulum is designed to take out the negative green and put in the positive green. 
is designed to take out the negative green of your past life memory bank and put in the positive love. Isis, heart chakra, green. We're having a green day. <laughs> green heart space. Um, so it's, it's designed to do that. Do you see what I mean? Colour. So well, you've got the earth colours. They all come out of uh, the ground. And when they come together and meet the esoteric colours of the sun, that's why an ancient site is aligned to the sunrise. It's not to go, oh, I'm at Stonehenge. Isn't that lovely? Oh, look, so it's above the hillstone. It's because these energies are coming together, especially the long red wave at dawn and they come together like this and that's uh, uh, the esoteric side of a solar alignment. It's aligning the colours together with Gaia. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? So how long have I got? I thought I'd take you through the very early days of dowsing and you can have an experiment with this. Remember what I said when you work with the waters, with the esoteric uh, water divining? You awaken it and ask. So I'm going to see if I get a reaction. Yeah, I feel a slight pull. Now these are great fun. They're hazel, okay? Now hazel, why hazel? The ancient druids knew about the water, Gaia's yin water, as I call it, because they said at the centre of the world, centre of the earth, there's a massive pool of water. It's a sacred well around which grow nine hazel trees. And the hazelnuts fall into the water. The salmon eat the hazelnuts that are full of wisdom, bardic wisdom. So we use hazel because it was sacredly growing around the world. And there's his hump and the stingies, I said to, to Busty. There's a, an underground stream quite close to that surface stream. You often get that. Hope I'm not getting stung, so I'll more sandals. And then what happens is you hold the rod like this under tension. Can you see what I mean under tension? So you're really forcing it down. Do you see what I mean? You're, you're doing your utmost to push it down. And then when it comes to water, it will do this and go up like that, okay? And that's just for an average flowing gallon. So I'm gonna go over here, because this is where it is, near the stingies, unfortunately. Beautiful hazel trees over there. Now it's starting to rise under pressure and as much as you try to force that down, it, it just doesn't. That's an old fashioned way of water divining, tried and tested that I have done time and time again. So I've got a, a few spares if anyone wants to go later, please do and push it down. Do you see what I mean? Then I've got um, an antique rod, the guy Underwood, I've been talking about Underwood, haven't I? He used a rod like this. This is called the geodetic rod. And you hold it like this and around water, it will go click, click, click. And then you change hands. And if you want sacred uh, yin water, you hold it like that. Click, 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 click. And it does that. So that's now an antique rod. But the rod that uh, I use, and I just use one uh, rod, is I've got two here but I normally just use one uh, and it's copper and it's sleeved and I'm obviously I'm a woman I've got more copper in my blood so I work really well feminine people work very whether you're male or female work well with a rod like that and you can find anything but I don't say dowsing is about finding things I mean, that really annoys me when people say that it's about me interacting with Gaia do you see what I mean? So men have more iron in their blood. And I'm sure that's why Hamish made a lot of his rods with iron. Do you see what I mean? Because the men have more iron in their blood. So I think we can work with the metals. But my late father, he uh, knew an eccentric uh, Chinese geoman who we learnt loads from, uh, that said. Uh, and he was amazing. He made what he calls uh, feng shui rods. And these pick up on electromagnetic vortex energy alone. And then when they hit that, they go absolutely crazy. And you have to hold really tight. So he's designed them because to the Chinese, they don't go off to ancient sites. They want to know what they can work with in their own home. Yeah. So it's very green in, in a way. We're not polluting Gaia by going out. And they just walk around their property. And when that goes crazy like that, 
uh, that's where they would work with that energy, probably vortex energy coming out of uh, the ground. And they believe that's where you can, like form energy, manifest. Okay, so uh, there's those uh, different types. You can have an experiment with uh, these, these rods uh, if you want. Like I say, there's a lot of underground water uh, here. We're coming up to the hour. So has anyone got any questions they would like to ask? Is that when you're asking permission? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Tap. Think anything or any, or you no, not with a hazel twig. Okay. Not with a hazel twig. It's, it's because it's in the mythology of Druidry that it is associated with the water and the hazel trees. Uh, we believe it's pre programmed for that. But in normal dowsing, you would visualize, you would uh, say a mantra of what you're trying to find. So that's, that's great clarity. Thanks for asking that. Good question. The negative green. How do you just get that? Yeah, so uh, if you imagine when the, the, each hour of the day corresponds to one of the seven colours and the other colours, okay? If you want positive green in your life, because we're in British summertime, okay, at one o'clock, that's when the green ray pours down. Okay, so what the ancient Egyptians did, and, and this is where I teach the Isis pendulum dowsing, there's a pendulum, you can Google it, Isis pendulum. Uh, Google me on YouTube with Isis pendulum. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a device like this, and it's got lines, they're called batteries, but you can, un it's a double barreled one, I don't think I've got one here, it's double barreled, and so you unscrew the last chamber, as it's called, and then if you want to absent heal, or you want to capture, positive green, Isis energy, my goddess Isis at one o'clock. You go like that, breathe in the green, as much as vibrant as you can, then you go <sighs> into the pendulum, yeah? And all the priests, go to, go to Abydos, Google it. You'll see the priests all breathing into the pendulums. And, that, and so the idea is you're tuning to the sun god Ra. And when you've attuned to all of the colors at all of the times of the day, you are Ra. You are one with Ra, and you have become one with Isis. Do you see what I mean? Then it is a mighty healing energy device. And I've got loads of testimonials from my students all over the world that love, love Isis. And even if you don't know about the esoteric colours of the sun, put that to a side. That's techno stuff. What can I do to empower myself with Isis Pendulum? You can get one at theaveryexperience.co.uk. <laughs> I'm teasing. You can get it where you like. Um, and uh, when she goes clockwise, you don't program it, don't worry about any uh, times of the day. When she does this, she's putting in positive energy. When she's going counterclockwise, she's drawing it out. Even if you buy organic food, yeah? Even if you buy organic food, you'll notice she's taking toxins out because normally it's plastic, you know, that it's packaged in. You can put your water, charge your water up with, with Isis, and then that remembers it. House clearing ever so easy. You can empower yourself to house clear. You don't need, uh, you don't need your people, except at the avbexperience.co.uk. <laughs> no, seriously. And you can go around your own house. You can cleanse people as well. Find out their pockets of energy in their aura. So it's really easy to do, even if you, you haven't, don't understand these etheric colors of the sun. But just before I stop, uh, Eli's given me lovely permission and support because I'm hosting my own conference. You don't get many women hosting conferences. Um, anyway, it's gonna be in Avebury. We've got the most amazing keynote speaker. He's called Robert Temple. He wrote The Serious Mystery. He's talking about plasma. He has the best book out this year in the esoteric community, A New Science of Heaven, where he's talking about how we can work with plasma, our plasma beings, yeah? So Robert Temple's the keynote speaker. We've got Henk Viz, he's the Archdruid. We then have Daniel Doherty, he's the top, um, a sacred geometrist, yeah, if that's the right term, I think I made that name up, <laughs> sacred geometry. Uh, we've got Daniel doing that. We've got a beautiful Dawn Henderson. She's talking about crystal skulls. We've got the amazing uh, Peter Knight as well, and the unsung hero, Chris O'Kane. 
Chris O'Kane was the astronomer that calculated the Orion uh, star thing for Graham Hancock and Robert Braval. That's the first day. On the second day, we wanted to be very intimate like this. So you'll see Avery through the eyes of the Archdruid, and I'm a Druid as well, but uh, you'll be seeing it through the eyes of the Archdruid. You'll also be seeing Avery through the eyes of sacred geometry with Daniel and me with Earth Energies, Mary and Michael, and much more uh, beside. And then it will culminate in with the wonderful Peter Knight and Sue Wallace doing shamanic drumming at the 5,000 year old West Kennet Long Barrow. So there's some flyers over there. If anyone's interested, you know, please. It, oh yeah, dates, that's a good, that's a good thing. Who says I'm not grounded in these? Uh, September the 3rd and September the 4th at Avebury at the Social Hall, which has just been done up. It's I've got Wi-Fi. It, it's really lovely. We're very close to the stones as well. And that's what we want, to bring the, the sacred site knowledge, not through one person, because no one author has all of the answers. Together, we have the chapter. And that's what we're trying to do uh, with Avery, seeing it through the eyes of experts. You've been a great audience. Thanks a lot. Woo!